Hey. Can you hear me? I have no idea if this works because YouTube has been really unfriendly to me this time. It decided not to post the video on the channel and like minimize announcing it. So I don't know if this works, but I hope someone can write in the chat if you can hear me, see me. Um. Hey, can someone say hi in the chat? I can see there are six people. Um, okay, so I um, have not prepared anything specific to talk about. I just hope that you would, I don't know, uh, ask some questions because, um, oh, I got interesting. I got a message that, uh, that someone did write me in the chat, but I can't see any messages in the chat. Uh, YouTube is really not, not friendly this time. Um, well, hmm. yeah, so I, I, I don't see any messages in the chat. That's a problem, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the gods of YouTube have not been friendly. Mm. Oh, I got, oh. Oh, wow. There have been tons of messages. I just, thank you. I, th so there is my co-author who sent me a screenshot that there are tons of messages and I can see none of them. Like not, not a single one. That is wonderful. Um, give me a sec, maybe. Oh, okay. I, I found a way. Oh, I opened it in a different window and now I can see it. Great. Hey, okay. Sorry. Um, not my fault, really. Um, good to see you all, and thanks for coming. Um, okay, uh, enough with. Um, okay, can someone write one more message for that so that I see if if they get updated? Mm. Okay, hello, Maria. Uh, sounds good enough. Um, Okay, I hope they, they will be updated. Anyway, um, there was one question already, so let me try to think about that. And by the way, you can feel free to discuss the questions also in the chat. It's like, I have no universal wisdom. Uh, but anyway, so, um, okay. So there was a question when it comes to mathematical talent, how does aging uh, affect uh, the brain? And do you feel that your math abilities change over time? Um, oh, now I see that messages do appear just later. Okay, cool. Well, they appear with a delay, so I'm sorry. If I don't react to your joke, that's not because I'm retarded, it's because <laughs> they appear later. Um, yeah, so I think um, aging certainly does affect mathematical, um, the way you do math, but uh, not, not in the stereotypical way. So there is a stereotype that uh, math is a young profession and people do their best stuff when they're young. Uh, but um, as uh, Kevin Buzzard uh, said in his interview, um, this seems to be just a stereotype. So um, it's in reality, it's not like the brain you know, works better or worse. I think as different people mentioned in the interviews, it works differently. So you become maybe in some, um, how do I put this? So like the way you do math does change, but because like you have more experience, so you learn to do some things faster, whereas like the the actual executive function of your brain may work slower with years, but you have learned like the, the you know, fast tracks to do things faster. So I think um, that's what uh, happens um, is that 
um, yeah, like math ability, not math abilities, but the, the 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 process of doing math changes, but not in the way that like you can't do math after you're thirty or forty or something. That's like not not has not been proven to be the case. Um, okay, I wonder if. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a question to you guys about names for monthly balance interviews uh, in the next year. I, I do get um, a lot of requests for different interviews. So I um, the thing is that maybe uh, people don't realize is that most interviewees I ask for uh, reject my invitations. Um, for different reasons, but I guess the main reason is that many people are not comfortable with appearing on YouTube and speaking about you know complicated topics. Um, so la last few people I asked didn't answer me yet, but um, there is one thing that I that people where people did agree to, and I hope this will be fun. So I asked uh, to interview a couple who are both mathematicians, and I hope to ask how they how they do their work-life balance, which must be hard. Separating math from life if you have like two mathematicians living together. I don't know how they do that, so we'll figure it out. Um, do I plan to interview analysis and PDE people? Well, I would love to, except that I don't know any analysis and PDE people. That's a problem. I knew Mariana and I interviewed her. So if you have suggestions, look, let me describe you to you people I'm looking for, and then you can add suggestions. So there is this um, wrong, I mean, I heard from many people saying that like, oh, you just interview famous mathematicians, but that's not at all true. I, what I look for is not fame. I look for charismatic, open to talk about complicated issues, sincere, uh, kind, uh, inspiring people. And uh, people I can somehow relate to in or in some way, or maybe have, you know, maybe not know them well, but like at some at least somehow have some connection with them. So you know, these are already plenty of restrictions. Being famous is not one of them. So if you can of offer any candidates for analysis and PTE people, please do. I will check them out because I don't know anyone. Um, <laughs> YouTube still uh, does not update the chat for me, so I have to like open it every time. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, and it, oh, thank you for asking about Putnam exam. Actually, I haven't heard about it until recently. So there is a question: What's my opinion on Putnam exam? I haven't uh, I've never heard of it until I started reading the book that I recommended to you guys in the video the, uh, the what? Uh, about problem solving. My, the the Bible of my, of problem solving, um, and there there uh, are a lot of problems from the Putnam exam, and um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I so I got to love it because those are the problems that I can solve. So there are like some rational input problems which are <laughs> too hard for me with no practice <laughs> in doing it. And they're putting them exams problems that I can solve. So they are making me very happy. Um, thank you to people, to people for creating those exams. So I guess um, I don't have an opinion of... Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. It's it's an as far as I understood in, from the book, it's like an exam with the hardest problems you get um, in 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 U.S. high schools or something. Anyway, there are problems that are not obvious, but you can think about them and solve them without any background or any experience in solving Olympiad problems. So that's a great thing. Um, meanwhile, I got a recommendation for an interview. Thank you, Tanya. Um, Do I have favorite podcasts? Um, a, I hope that you people answer this question in the chat because I'd love to hear about your favorite podcasts. But uh, myself, I, I actually hate most podcasts and interviews. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds really 
arrogant, but I think most in there are several things that I dislike about most interviews usually, uh, like the way people do interviews. But there are two uh, Russian ones which I really like, which are I guess the most popular interview interviewers in Russia. Um, well, if there are any Russian speakers, I think they can guess who to the two people I'm talking about, so no need to name them. And those I do watch. But in general, I I would love to hear any recommendations for podcasts. Please share. Um, um, okay, cool. So uh, do mathematicians have any techniques to keep their brain healthy, like avoiding drugs and <laughs> stress haha <laughs> uh, or our last is, is not a big deal well of course I don't know for all the mathematicians however I do uh, I do guess that um, that most mathematicians would avoid using heavy drugs because or at least I mean I would avoid using heavy drugs exactly for that matter like my brain is the only thing I need for my work so I have to to make sure to protect it from uh, from strong changes. Uh, avoiding stress is not something mathematicians can do, I think. I mean, our job comes with a lot of stress, so that's impossible. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think, like, I don't know, drinking beer or something helps some mathematicians, they claim, to do math, so light stuff. But, like, I mean, in general, I think, yeah, yeah I don't know. I don't know about all people, but surely, I think surely do all mathematicians realize that the brain is the only thing they need for, for their job. Then what they do with it is a, another question. Um, okay, I kill, uh, why? I kill what? I kill Matthew would not be an analysis or a PDE person. Oh, it's just a suggestion for an interview. Well, I kill is on my potential interviewees list, um, but I have, I have a long list of like my colleagues whom I know somehow. So, um, oh yes. Thank you. So uh, Johannes is right. So there is a there is a reason why I don't drink coffee. It's because all mathematicians always say that they cannot do math without coffee. So I hope that one day I'll start drinking coffee and then, you know, math will become understandable. Uh, but yeah, at every conference, everyone like keeps saying that they cannot go to a talk without a coffee. So apparently mathematicians drink lots of coffee. Um, um, ba -dim, ba -dim, ba -dim. Um, so about about interview, I mean interviewing people in different stages of their math career. Surely it's interesting to talk to people at different stages of their math career. However, I believe that putting on YouTube interviews where you discuss sensitive subjects and um, people's struggles is not a good idea until they have a faculty position uh, because it may you know a it may affect negatively their job search. B they may regret later strongly what they said, because during these years of PhD and postdoc, I think your um, relationship with math and with your job changes a lot. And you may strongly regret something you said a year ago. So I'd rather, um, I'd rather not put on YouTube interviews with younger folks. However, I, I do want to include younger people somehow. So maybe I, I, I have one dream <laughs> related to it. I don't know if I find any uh, volunteers, but there is, uh, so we mentioned Marcel Proust already several times on this channel, and he has a list of like his questionnaire, which has abstract questions unrelated to doing math. So I'm thinking of maybe once making an interview where I ask some of the like nice questions from that questionnaire to a younger person and see what happens. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so what's next? Um, uh -huh. How did I get into math and at what point did I know I was interested in it? Well, I made a video about it and then I had to take it down, unfortunately. Uh, but I was interested in math since like the first day of seventh grade where we had a, uh, so <laughs> seventh grade means like, how old are you? Uh, 11 years old and we, we had a new math teacher and he came into the classroom and he started with writing a formula with like no explanation whatsoever it was a formula uh with quanters defining a function but like with no words just quanters and symbols so it was extremely mysterious and from that day on 
I was, I guess, seduced by the mystery of mathematics. And math never became clear. In fact, the more you learn it, the more complicated it is. But at least it has remained mysterious. Um, so, but I mean, that's just my story for other people. You know, one of my co-authors said he only got interested in math um, at the university. So it doesn't have to be seventh grade. It's just I had a teacher who gave me the interest. Oh, apparently quanters are called quantifiers in English. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Um, did oh, but but what is, in my opinion, what is the really difficult thing you face while doing research level math? Well, I mean, we have every interview discussing it, so you have, if you watch them, have already learned that. Uh, I mean, what is for other people, for me personally, the psychological part of doing math is the hardest. Because um, so recently I've been only thinking about math in terms of a relationship, like a romantic relationship. I mean, I don't know, marriage or something like that. Like it's an intense connection where you, I mean, occasionally you're happy to see each other. Occasionally you are super annoyed by each other. Occasionally you hate each other. Sometimes you want to leave. Sometimes you, you want to come. Like it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a quite, connection that is not what most people have with their jobs I think where people like most people say that you know they leave their job at 6 p.m and they don't think about it in the evening or on weekends I mean uh, it's hard to find a mathematician who will tell you they never think about um, about their you know about something related to their job on the weekends that's I mean it's impressive if they can. Some some mathematicians even said that having kids helped them to separate to like create a boundary with mathematics. Oh yeah, maybe that's the best. Com like it's extremely hard to create boundaries with mathematics if you're a mathematician. That's maybe this I think summarizes whatever all the interviewers are telling in different ways about their struggles. That's <laughs> um, okay. So um, ba -dim, ba -dim, ba -dim, ba -dim. I'm looking at your questions. So. Um, Okay, my friend Dima is asking, what about collaborations? Um, have one author papers become more of an exception or not really? And if so, if it is socially justified or it is that math has become harder somehow? That's an, yeah, these are interesting questions. I'm also wondering about it. I think it is true that one author papers became more of an exception. I think the not only did math become harder but also internet became more accessible so i think for people to communicate to communicate became much easier and uh, i mean even having such a thing as dropbox or something when you can work on one file together uh is has simplified collaborations a lot if people before had to you know send letters um it's i i think that that plays a big role um I mean, of course, also math became harder, I guess, but um, uh, but yeah, um, maybe internet. Uh, okay, so if it is socially justified, well, of course, there are other aspects, like if everyone around you is writing collaboration pa papers in collaboration, they, so when you're have papers in collaboration, you may, you, it's easy to have several projects at the same time. That's what most people do. If you're working alone, you, I mean, at any time I'm working on, I mean, you may have also several projects, but I think it's harder to be simultaneously working on them. And switching between projects is very important because as Dennis said, keeping up the motivation is super hard. So um, I think it's much easier to keep up the motivation when you're stuck at something, you switch to something else. And I think this being able to switch between things is easier when you have collaborations. So in a sense, given that job market is very competitive, it makes sense that more and more people are working in collaborations, but not everyone. I mean, not a, there are some people who still um, do math on their own. So we have a professor here in Zurich and a friend of, uh, who works on extremely hard questions alone. And a friend of mine said about him that he's climbing Mount Everest on, on his own, you know, so it's like that kind of hardship. Um, 
learning okay uh i should write down learning someone as a podcast um okay i should look through your comments later they're the ones that are not questions um okay so what's my take on math during covid i think covid uh in general it looks to me that pandemic um affected people differently i mean okay besides the objective difficulties it seems to me that some people were turned so like it's important if you're flexible or not so people who are more flexible somehow quickly learned to use discord and such things and somehow advanced in in and found new collaborators all over the world or something whereas some people got stuck in the i wish this is over and waiting for the covid to be over stage and if you're you know if you're still waiting for it to be over and uh, um, refusing so i i mean i still hear people saying that they don't want to do things online i mean it's been um it's been a long time so um in that sense i mean besides the objective difficulties of say having kids at home and such like assume uh we don't speak about that the there some people approached this new so covid some people approached it as like oh new opportunities i mean not covid like lockdowns let's say new opportunities we can um we can so i mean for, so for dennis and i for example did a series of online conferences and we were super happy that we could do that because you know normally organizing conferences is a lot of work for us it was like how oh, let's send an email invite speakers la la we organized a series of conferences great for us so uh i found it that it gave a lot of opportunities however of course um for keeping up motivations it's important to meet your colleagues and conferences while they were exhausting they gave i mean in person conferences gave lots of motivation which is not present now and for students i mean i'm sorry i almost spoke about researchers but for students it seems to be hard not to meet their peers in person and uh i i feel really sorry for students and for phd students it's also hard to so i used to you know go and chat, chat with my advisor every day when i did phd and then my phd siblings at this time had to meet him once a week for an hour on zoom uh which is you know much much less um so that's has been difficult for people but i mean discord and other stuff are great okay peer reviewing process typical experience with referring a paper oh my god johannes that's a terrible question i i hate referring so much <laughs> i think people should stop asking me to referring papers i don't know checking details is so so hard um i mean my I don't know. I think the whole already several people complained in the interviews about the whole publishing process. So I wish there were computers to check math proofs and we wouldn't need to do this uh unreliable thing where we check other people's math. I don't know. Look, my I don't I, don't, I so wish there were better ways to check math papers that's what we currently do so what we currently do i think is every one of us once in a while gets a paper to referee then we postpone it for several months then eventually we try to read it we get stuck in details and um and and then you know we make some comments but still it's like so imperfect that i don't know I wish there was a better way. I also find it extremely unfair that journals get tons of money for publishing our papers and refereeing is for free. Refereeing is a work that we actually I mean we write as as Dustin said I think we write papers for for free. We referee papers for free and journals get all the money. That's great. Great scheme that works. That's my everything is very unfair. <laughs> um okay. is becoming a mathematician a viable career now and in the future should only highly trained and interesting kids like IMO winners and participants be encouraged to go into math as a profession well a i have a very strong opinion about IMO winners and participants as the only kids who are encouraged to do math as a profession because when i was studying at the university i was in the group of like smart kids which was nine IMO winners and participants and me <laughs> <laughs> and guess what the nine people were encouraged to to go into math and not me and uh the only person who went into math professionally was me in the end so um i'm sure that doing math 
is not much, I mean, it is correlated, but surely participation at IMO should not be the criterion of only only those people should go into math. Um, I'm also not, I mean, highly trained, highly trained, that's like the same thing with IMO, highly trained means that you have spent a lot of time on doing math as a kid, which may mean that you're, I don't know, very smart, no, like, sorry. You may be smart regardless of that, but uh, it it may mean that your interest has grown with this high training or that your motivation has gone down because you were trained so much. So I think motivation and your enthusiasm is so much more, and interest as you wrote, is so much more important than how were you trained until the age of, I don't know, uh, until the young age. So, um, I, but let me think a bit. So this is a very important question, actually. And I think professors often avoid answering your, this question, whether it is a viable career. Somehow, it's very funny. So to be honest, academia is a, like one of the weird things about it, that like all students are encouraged to stay in academia and encouraged to pursue research, whereas the amount of jobs for researchers is much, much fewer than the amount of, let's say, even PhD positions. So for every, I think for the statistics is about like one, one of the statistics I saw is that for every seven PhD positions, there is one professorship. So this means that um, ev encouraging everyone may be uh, unfair. However, there is no way to predict who, who will keep up the motivation and the interest. So uh, sometimes people who do better in the beginning, like go down faster, and like lose interest in or, or get interested into something in something else, which is also totally legit. So in a sense, it is a viable profession. It is very hard to make it to like to to become a professor is very hard. And there is no way to predict if you're interested in math, there is no way to predict whether I mean no no way to say like no you're not good enough. So actually I'm getting lots of emails asking from, from people. Like the main question I'm getting is People I don't know write me emails asking whether I think they're good enough to do math. I mean, uh, <laughs> obviously I'm no prophet to say that. However, I also think the question, the, there is no good answer to this question. Basically, if you're interested, keep doing. And you'll find, I mean, if things go the worst way possible, you'll find a job later anyway, I think. But um, maybe try to enjoy the process instead of, Seeing doing math is like some end goal of becoming someone. I mean, if you enjoy the process, go for it. If you don't, well, then you're masochistic. And that's, I guess, part of it. Um, okay. So, how do I see the future of math research mathematics? Will it do what? Oh. Well, I, I don't have to answer the question about AIs since I know nothing about them. However, Kevin, who is buzzard, who is an expert on, on, on well, one of the experts at this point on, <laughs> on computer proofs and such, has uh, convinced us in his interview that we'll be fine for a while. Computers seem to be not as smart and not as independent of humans that they won't take our jobs anytime soon, apparently. Um, what mathematical idea or field am I the most proud of? This is not, there is no good answer to this question, I think, because every field of math and every idea that made it through at least five years is interesting, but interest is extremely subjective, as in the more you know about some part of math, the more interesting it looks to you, because I think interest is is... Uh, is how how well so we find some idea in math interesting if we know how it is connected to several other ideas or questions or concepts in mathematics the more those connections usually the more interesting we find it so um but there may exist connections with like i personally don't know about so then i would just see a random fact and it, it would tell me nothing however like the more background you know the more interesting it looks like so i find algebraic key theory extremely interesting but that's because I spent several years studying algebraic key theory. So, you know. Um, it's great that you, I mean, maybe the fact that you all 
you know, some of you are interested in improving refereeing process. Maybe it will in the future it will lead to better refereeing process. I think. Oh my God! So the I mean the problem with refereeing is no one usually likes to referee. <laughs> so if your suggestion is to make more people do refereeing. People might object. However, I agree. I mean, any I, th I think any discussion would be better than doing things on your own. So, um, well, so there was, I heard uh, a colleague saying that it would be funny if, uh, like, fun, if on archive we had, you know, you could put a like and dislike, like, you know, on YouTube videos uh, for papers. Uh, however, I mean, we, we people rarely give feedback in in the math community in general. So if you give them place to give feedback, they might still not give it because, again, I mean, if some paper looks uninteresting to you, there are two reasons for that. Either because you understand it so well and it looks so trivial to you, but then again, mm, something might look trivial because it's already done by someone. It's not like, you know... Uh, it would take effort for you to do it. Or it might look uninteresting because you don't know the connections of this stuff with something else. So um, maybe one can only judge really stuff in like their very, very narrow area of interest. Um, so <laughs> well, then, uh, Dennis thinks that likes and dislikes is a disaster. Dennis, it's a suggestion. I mean, I heard of it as of a suggestion by Ben Antio. So, um, <laughs> Not my idea. <laughs> yeah, and so what I'm saying is that people usually avoid giving feedback because they know that their feedback, the, the feedback like about math papers is often lazy opinions. So you look at something, um, uh, to, to say something, to be sure of your opinion of a math paper, you should spend a lot of time studying like this paper and things around it. So um, it's hard to be confident of your opinion about about math things since math is so so how to say multi-dimensional. Let's say. Um, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm, an, um, I'm looking at your questions. Wait, there must be a question mark. Pudum, pudum. Does having personal commitments hinder possibilities to move for postdocs visits and further future opportunities? I mean, of course, unfortunately, I, th I find it very unfortunate that academia requires you to move for a while, whereas with relationships and children, it's re it's often really hard. And I think it's it's I think one of the main reasons why people leave academia, because I mean, you have a family and especially kids. At some point, it gets hard to move if you want your partner also to. Be happy with their job. So, uh, however, I hope that university. I mean, people know about this problem. So, um, universities do try to do something about it. There nowadays, when you apply for a job, you can write that you're solving a two-body problem, so you can say about it. And also, universities started putting more effort into offering childcare opportunities. So, some there is some progress in this direction. However, I do think it's some like. Unfortunately, so far, um, commitments do restrict your opportunities. Yes, that's a sad fact, I think. Um, am I personally interested in the connection between mathematics and physics? Well, I didn't manage to understand any, phys any physics in school. I really tried, but it was beyond beyond my intellectual capacities. I learned all the formulas you need to solve pr physics problems, but I still do not understand how electricity works and stuff like that and magnets. I mean, I, I really spend so much time asking everyone to explain this to me and somehow I never felt like I had an intuition for these things. So I'm not smart enough to understand physics, sorry. But I mean, many mathematicians are interested in physics in general. And, oh, sorry, I forgot to say, there the the part of math I'm working on, there are some things that often are said, like the intuition comes from physics. So that's actually cool. So in algebraic geometry, there is this part of algebraic geometry that some people in the chat are working on, where physicists offer us like conjectures slash expected formulas, and then mathematicians prove them to be true. But then we often don't understand how physicists came to it. And physicists don't care too much for our proofs because, I mean, they're already happy with their conjectures. And 
Um, so there is a funny uh, connection between math and physics, just like some part, well, in different parts of math, but in particular in a close enough to what I'm doing. Um, but it's, um, yeah, the, the connection is not symmetric <laughs> somehow. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> what do I think of condensed sets? I mean, condensed sets are great. They, they. I don't think they substitute topological spaces. It's like it's a new, uh, new part, um, part of mathematics. What do you call it? New formalism, which is is great, and uh, it uh, uses. To, I mean. <laughs> Logical spaces are good, just maybe not uh, condensed sets. Add new opportunities; they don't uh, they don't replace the. How do I say? It? Um, mm, yeah, so I was just saying. I don't think they substitute topological sets. I think they add opportunities to what you can do uh, in terms of considering topological structures on algebraic objects. Um, Mm. Oh, greetings to Mexico. Um, <laughs> um, um, any advice on learning undergraduate real analysis for the first time? Don't be scared. <laughs> um, there will be at some point, there will be long formulas. I think how are they called? Was it there was Maclaurin in the, the? I mean, I don't remember Taylor Maclaurin or something. Anyway, there were at some point formulas that were more than three lines long, and I was I thought this is the hardest part of mathematics, and then turn, later it turned out it was the easiest. So um, yeah, don't be scared. You will have. I mean, if real analysis looks hard now, it will look easier in a year. So don't. Don't worry about it. I don't have any math advice for it. Uh, take your time. Things are unclear now. Let them process in your head. And ask questions to people around. They might explain you things. Um, about my IMO friends. Well, <laughs> I like anima because <laughs> Because I learned Latin and ancient Greek in high school, so all Latin words I'm, I prefer to, to, uh, yeah. Uh, however, some of my colleagues complain a lot about anime, so. And I mean, I, mean, I think anime is nice. I like anime. <laughs> okay, so at which point did my IMO friends lose interest in math? I mean, friends is a strong word for, for. Um, people I studied with, but um, mm, it's not so much about the material, but uh, as far as I interpret it, and it's my personal reframing may have nothing to do with reality. However, my impression was that when you do math Olympiads, you, you are given a problem which you can, I mean, you may not always be able to solve it, but you always understand the statement of the problem. And so then you have come up to come up with something. And then when you learn uh, a bit later at the university, when you learn abstract math, you um, you have to have, I mean, the more abstract the, um, the parts of math are, the more black, black boxes you have to take. So you have to accept that at the moment you have like this statement where you may not understand some parts of it or some definitions. You, you don't fully understand them. However, you should somehow learn to be able to work with them. And I think that was the, the, the abstraction on, for my IMO fellows, um, in the sense that it is, the, it is an opposite skill to solving a, an Olympiad problem to be able to work with a lot of black boxes. And it looked to me that when we were studying topology or, um, yeah, some like, what was it? Well, I don't know, Romanian geometry. So something more, more abstract that they were. I remember preparing to to an exam with with, with some of my, some of them, and I remember that I was like okay with 
skipping some parts and then um, a classmate of mine said that he, 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 he does not want to, go, to even go to the exam because there are some definitions that he does not fully understand to the like core details of everything. And, um, oh yeah, thank you. Well, I'm a kind of um, if it's long, is it long then, Dima? <laughs> Should be long. <laughs> um, um, Yeah, so the whole point of my answer is that if you enjoy Olympiad problems, I'm very happy for you, but be prepared to deal with black boxes and not understanding statements and even definitions later on. And not only not understanding, but somehow being able to, to work with them in, and look at them back later. So um, I think that's what my advisor spoke about in his interview, that somehow you don't build a fundament of like good understanding in order to like usually you don't learn everything detail by detail until you get somewhere you you're like walking on ice and then occasionally you know fixing some holes in your uh background here and there but it's not it's not as steadily built as when you do it um Starting your first math research project. Oh, oh, I'm so, I, I feel uh, touched that, it, that you will be doing your first thing. Well, um, advice. Well, A, I mean, I. I I don't have anything original to say. I've done too many interviews and now I feel that everything I can say was already said by someone, but Drew said in his last interview that um, the first research project is harder, like having done your first research project is a harder um, thing than having done your next 58 project in some sense. That, that Like the, the gap between zero and one is bigger than the gap between one and 50. So, um, mm, it is it is an intimidating mountain to climb objectively. However, I don't know. As as always, my my only advice is like try to enjoy it, because it will be hard anyway and scary anyway. So I think all you can do is try to enjoy it. And um, if you're so if it's your own research project, then you must have an advisor, I guess. So ask them a lot of questions. Uh, try to and and um, sorry, I, I keep repeating the same things, but like I think the more questions you ask about your research project, the more you will learn. And don't be afraid to ask questions. The metaphor behind the tortoise in the Matlab Balance logo is that I have a tortoise in St. Petersburg at my home with my parents. We have a long distance relationship. Um, and so uh, because of her, I have lots and lots and lots of tortoises at, and turtles at my house, mainly in St. Petersburg, but also some here. Um, and um, so, just tortoises surround me everywhere in my life. Um, that's why we have one on the logo. And also, uh, by accident, um, tortoise is the only thing I can draw, schematically at least. So that's it. <laughs> no deep meaning. <laughs> um, um, Can I give an example of the words abstract and black box? I mean, this all these notions are complete are not objective because for different people, different things are abstract and uh, and black. I mean, black box is anything that you at the moment. So it's like some fact or some notion that you don't understand yet well, but you can accept it and uh, try to and. Uh, do something with it. I mean, even, okay, I don't know, the notion of a continuous function. I mean, there is a definition. I mean, you learned this epsilon delta business in your real analysis class, I guess. But before you know it, you may hear a statement about a continuous function and you should be able to imagine what a continuous, I mean, you can be able to imagine what a continuous function is without knowing and understanding the details of this delta epsilon definition. And then the first time you see the definition with delta and epsilon, it may look confusing 
but then should still be able to understand some facts about these functions and later understand the definition. That's the kind of process I'm trying to convey. That like uh, should be able to look at the examples and at the properties and uh, add some further facts, and then maybe later get back to the to looking again at the definition and seeing why it makes sense. Um, whereas the other approach is like, oh, you don't understand the definition, you get stuck at it forever, and that's it. That's maybe what I'm referring to. Um, um, I don't, Dennis, by the way, I don't know to which to which you're given you're giving an example. Um, but yeah, so in the word abstract, of course, abstract is anything that that it is for you hard to imagine. So for everyone, uh, for everyone, it's different. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Dennis points out that um, there is another thing with black boxes is that any I think any researcher, not any, most of researchers uh, use in their work lots of uh, facts that they don't know full proofs of. And that also means taking things as black boxes, but you somehow you hope that if you look at the proof, you'll be able to understand it. But I mean, we often use proofs we don't understand. And that's, yeah, I mean, there is some lacking comfort in that. Um, okay. How does it feel to be a mathematician painful uh, and exciting and painful um, and exciting? Uh, different proportion at different days, you know. Um, does it feel very cool that you understand the most abstract and rigorous objects? Well, not at all, because as a mathematician, you constantly don't understand things. Like, you know, the, 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 you spend the time, like, you don't understand, don't understand, don't understand. Then at some point, you do understand. And then you look back and you're like, so why didn't I understand it before? It's like, the, you, there are only seconds when you can appreciate that you understood something, because once you have understood something, it becomes trivial. So you cannot be really happy for a long time. I mean, it's hard to be happy for a long time that you understood something because it became trivial. So you spend most of your time not understanding. So uh, that so I think as a mathematician you mostly feel stupid. I don't know. Um, there is this stereotype that mathematicians must feel like like geniuses are very smart. I don't know. I think looking around mathematicians when they do their work they mostly feel stupid uh, because math math is like always more complicated than anything you can digest because it's like so huge so it's hard to feel cool but uh is there a tendency to look down on mere mortals well um while it's a joke i should say that i think there is such a tendency not among all mathematicians but it would be unfair to say that it does not exist i think it does exist at least when i was um when i was well i, I said i have a thing against i'm <laughs> against the Olympiads in particular, or like against trainings to Olympiads in particular, I, t I taught in the in a math camp in Russia and there uh, they, they are, the teachers, the instructors made t-shirts for everyone. And the text on the t-shirt said, a mathematician will do better, dot. Like that was the slogan. And I, I mean, I was, I was a kid back then, but already then it looked like um, not a great idea for me to to, <laughs> to give out such t-shirts to people who study math. Uh, so, for example, but on a more more general level, there is a tendency, I think, among pure mathematicians to look down on applied mathematicians. So, um, I personally find it very unreasonable in in general. I think I don't think that. My personal opinion is that mathematicians are not smarter than non-mathematicians. I think what the the special thing they 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 have is um, or like among let's say in say in pure math is being fascinated by abstraction or say being able to deal with some very abstract concepts. However, it's only one fragment of the whole you know intelligence and. Um, I would argue against mathematicians being better or smarter in any way than others. So this looking down thing always annoys me very much. Um,
um, did I have any aha moments in my childhood or education when I was surprised when I surprised myself with how capable I was <laughs> or it's always pain I mean um um mm, no i I personally have never felt um surprised with how capable I am as well no, I don't think so because of this effect that like once you solve something, I don't know, maybe others have have felt differently so. Uh, no, it's yeah, it's not. It's not always pain. I'm just saying. I mean, then the question was whether uh, whether you you feel particularly capable in math at some points. I don't know. No, I don't. But like, it's not. I mean, there's lots of joy. The joy is from from seeing connection in math and from seeing some beautiful results, which are so. I personally, I mean, I think I get the biggest joy from math when I see something counterintuitive being true. So. It's like exciting as I don't know when you see aurora on the sky, you know, it's something that you don't expect on the sky, so it's very beautiful and wow. And in Matthew, you, you see, I mean, at every conference day, it's like an exhausting day full of talks, but there is an aurora shining at some point in some talk at every day, and so you know. Um, um, and um okay so um please oh guys so uh while i get a lot of requests for for interviews the the thing that most suggested interviews have in common is uh one thing uh a fuels medal uh as we see from yet another request uh i'd like to have a more <laughs> diverse uh selection of interviews i i did however ask recently two other fields medalists for interviews because i have concrete things to to talk to them about to ask them about uh they have not yet found time but maybe later so my dream interviews are um have I forgot their names? This would be a problem. Okay, so I wrote recently to Etienne Gis, and uh, before that to help me out, someone there. I forgot the author of my favorite essay onto uh, onto cultures in mathematics. Okay, so we'll write in the chat. Um, Anyway, I hope to interview them. Um, I think, I mean, Terry Tao has a blog where he writes everything he wants to say. I don't see the point. I mean, uh, there are things he wants to share and then he will write them in the blog or things he doesn't want to share and then I cannot make him speak about them. So um, I don't know. I think people with blogs are actually not such good targets to interview. I made one interview which you guys didn't see because that's one that I decided not to post where I tried to interview someone who has a cool blog. And I mean, that person told me things that are in the FAQ to that blog. So uh, while the blog is great, uh, it was not, um, um, it was not, um, not so interesting because of that. So, um, do mathematicians learn how to proofs mostly from other mathematicians or from books? I think, I mean, by books, I guess you also mean papers. I think this is a process where you go a lot from one to the other. So you open the paper, look at the abstract, then you try re start reading the proof, get confused, talk to someone, get back to the proof. It looks then way more understandable than, but like you get stuck again, ask someone. So it's like you go back and forth between texts and people, I think mostly. So, I mean, some people sure prefer one to the other, but I think going back and forth is um, is the most reasonable thing, or at least for me, most helpful thing. Um, 
Yeah, try to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation is not only a description of math at your level, but A, it's a description of doing math in general. B, I hear it may be a description of adult life in general. <laughs> So when you're, I mean, you know, it's, if you've only ever done math in your life like me, then it's hard to separate the difficulties you have because of doing math and the difficulties you have because of growing up. And or maybe it's just difficulties you have as a human being. So I fear all people have to spend a lot of time trying to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> um, advice to give to girls who want to study object i mean subjects where they're underrepresented i mean don't believe anyone who tells you that you cannot do things uh remember that um don't believe anyone who tells you that you get an opportunity just because you're a girl because at this point there are already enough girls to uh not get everything just because you're a girl that's like that is impossible and you will hear things like that and um so okay on a more on a deeper level so there was a ted talk i don't remember by whom so there was a ted talk about uh research on girls in in stem and um there were some funny exper like interesting experiments so um, so i think one one thing i remember is that um girls and boys were mm, were given uh, a task in programming and uh, they had 20 minutes and uh, after 20 minutes they could show their partial results maybe they didn't solve the whole problem but they could show their partial results to the instructor and what happens is that uh, i mean guys would mostly not solve the full thing but they would say oh i did something or like the program didn't work um, but like there is the program, I don't understand why it works, why it doesn't work. And then they would discuss with the instructor why. And the girls would, uh, so many more of the girls would show an empty uh, screen and say, oh, I did nothing after 20 minutes. And it, I mean, you know, your first reaction would be that, um, okay, girls, girls did less or something. However, the instructors pressed uh, the back button. And uh, it turned out that many of the girls would have, would, I mean, they did get a, the same partial progress or similar non-working programs, but they have deleted them fully and said that they have done nothing. Uh, and this was, a, I mean, one of the differences. And um, I have certainly uh, seen such an, I mean, this did resonate with, say, my personal experience. And um, mm, I mean, there, so I guess it's important for girls or underrepresented minorities or whoever who struggle psychologically with whatever they're studying to to learn more about these uh, differences, which, I mean, maybe because of social, cultural standpoint, whatever, but, like, it's important to learn about these things, I think, in order to understand, oh, like, the fact that imposter syndrome is recognized to be more, to be stronger among underrepresented minorities. Um, so, I mean, one thing is just to, to, I mean, you can be interested or not into why this is happening, but just knowing it helps to to recognize it. And also for teachers, I think it's important, like few instructors normally in real life, and it's not a psychological experiment, I think few people would guess to press a back button of a person who says they have done nothing. You just like do it, they have done nothing, right? And uh, to see that they have done the same amount of work, but they were like ashamed to show it or afraid that it's not perfect, hence they cannot show it. Um, that's an important thing to remember. Um, uh, <laughs> how does one keep um, uh, keep in their memory? I guess uh, lots of definitions, theorems, and examples. Well. I think the main thing in math is for, or like it looks to me that it's not separate definitions, theorems and examples, but more of connections between them. So you may remember the connections or you may have forgotten something, but when you see something, it reminds you of that thing that you saw before. So uh, in a sense, it's not like memorizing a list. So I don't know when you when you learn 
a new language, you have to memorize a bunch of words, right? And there maybe their genders or something like some array of random information. Whereas in math, it's not like that. It's um, there are many more connections and many reasons why something is logical. So of course, it helps to understand a definition if you see why it is defined that way. And I think the mm, to me, a good teacher is the person who explains you why we are interested in these objects or why the facts are the way they are. I mean, there is, you know, a statement, a proof, and also often a moral explanation or an example why a simpler thing didn't work. Um, for example, I was reading the notes today for a class of, in commutative algebra to teach, and I really liked that in the notes there is a definition and then there is an explanation that if we had introduced a simpler definition, this would make no sense, like that some, num some numer numerical invariant, it would almost always be infinity if you did the simpler thing that is maybe more natural. So, um, so uh, the more of these moral things you understand, the easier it is to remember. But also it's okay to forget things because when you see them second time, it's, is, it's often easier to like you recognize something. So forgetting is fine. Somewhere in the back of your brain, things, things stay somehow. So don't worry about it. Um, I mean, I would say out of all the subjects, learning math, le like keeping math in memory to me always was the easiest out of all subjects in school because I don't know, in biology, you have to learn the name of bones or like a list of them. Uh, they're, they're like, or in history, you have to learn the dates. Like there is no way to remember that some something was in some year unless you like, you have to learn that year, right? In math, there is more explanation to why things are the way they are. <laughs> um, so there's a question about languages and paper as well. Most papers are written in English. Then there are French people who keep writing papers in French. But if you know English, you'll be fine with understanding French papers. I mean, you won't be able to pronounce them properly, but um, but you'll be fine. And there are some Russian papers from the old days from USSR. And you might need a Russian friend occasionally. Uh, <laughs> um, but... Um, I think English owns most of it. Let's see. So, um, uh, minimum, minimum, minimum. Um, let's see. So, reading new papers a lot can diverge you from your main problem. Is it true? I mean, you have to find a balance, I guess. I would not be afraid of, I mean, um, I think Rahul said in his interview that his job as an advisor is to like push a PhD student in the opposite direction uh, to which they're drawn uh, naturally. Like if a student is drawn to focus on one problem, Rahul's job would be to to try to push him into expanding their horizons and the other way around. So, um, <laughs> so um, if you only ever read new papers and never work on your on your own problem, that may be not optimal for writing a PhD thesis. However, uh, I think reading, I mean, expanding your math horizons is great. Is important. It's how you how you, I mean, that's part of your job and it's an important part of learning math. So I think what I saw among PhD students is usually the other way around, like focusing on, on one problem and trying to ignore as much as possible the rest of math that I would think is a suboptimal strategy. Uh, or rather, it will, I mean, I don't see how it leads to to becoming a researcher, but I mean, that's my personal opinion. So don't don't be afraid to learn too much math. That's uh, what I would say. Um, when do you know or feel that you are ready to tackle on a research problem or project? Well, I mean, when you have some idea how to 
I mean, when you have an idea on how to approach your problem or project, like usually you feel ready when there is some idea you want to try out, right? It's not like you stare at a random problem and like, oh, I'm ready to tackle it. I mean, you know, you think about different things and then occasionally you feel that you have an idea how something could approach something and then most often it doesn't work, but you you if you, you want to give it a try. Or take the book with problems for kids and look at Putnam exams and then you can solve. <laughs> I think there, so there is some internal discussion in the chat, but I think I so far answered all the questions you wrote or please write if there was something I missed. Um, um. <laughs> when you write can i hold a math question in my mind the whole day i imagine you know carrying something on your on your head like the african women um typical image and then not let it fall the whole day but it's not i mean the math question it's like you started thinking about something you don't know how to how to solve it so you think about something else and then you think about who said what uh, and then you think about what people think of you and then you think about random nonsense and then your brain is like oh by the way <laughs> here is an idea to what you forgot you thought about two hours ago so um i think maybe that's one thing all oh, like many mathematicians have in common or a human brain has in common is that it keeps working in in the background once you're, you, it seems like that you're doing something else, but your brain keeps working on, on this thing. So it helps to to try to think about something for a while and then um, and then not not like distract yourself from it. And the brain might do the work for you and give you some suggestion. For me personally, unfortunately, it look it 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 looks like in the evening I think that something might work, and then I don't think about it like when going to bed. I have a rule to not do math after 10 p.m. So like 10 to midnight, I have my two hours of doing something random and then I go to bed. And then when I wake up, the first thought, the first thought is a mistake in what I have hoped would work in the evening. So um, that's uh, then disappointing. But yeah, that's just the brain that kept working at night. Or so. um, Feel free to share your experiences in the chat, by the way. I'm very happy to, to learn about you. And maybe to stop thinking that everyone, every mathematician is the same. <laughs> you can also ask less polite questions. I think I might not so, uh, post this video, so feel free um, to, to share with us your deepest Secret questions. I implemented a rule about no math after 10 p.m. because if I do math before going to bed, then the whole night, or at least was from what I remember, the whole night I get nightmares that I keep doing math and I it's like it, fe it feels as if I'm really working on a math problem and I get really exhausted. And in the morning I feel exhausted and also the math problem I was working on is some complete nonsense. It's like ridiculous. And so, um, so I hate the feeling of waking up exhausted as if you worked hard and nothing has happened. So that's why in the evening, like late evening, I, I, I think about something else. See, uh, uh, oh yeah. So that's uh, ah, that's my delayed comments. Okay, so that's not just me. Um, but I mean, there there are other mathematicians who prefer to work at night or something. I don't know. Maybe they don't remember their dreams. Maybe that's the difference. <laughs> but it's not it's not just about math. I remember my sister told me that the hardest thing she worked as a waitress for some time, and she said the hardest was that after waiting tables for the whole day, she would dream at night that she's waiting tables, and so you know, it's like not something you want to dream about at night after a whole day of waiting tables. So, 
Um, okay, the notes in commutative algebra are by uh, Professor at ETH Emanuel Kowalski. I can write in the chat. Um, so I liked. Uh, I mean, I'm reading them because I have to teach a course in algebraic geometry next semester, but I really liked the notes. So, um, <laughs> I'm a PhD student. Sometimes I feel stuck, do not know what to do. Uh, welcome to our world. That's how mathematics feels like. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, the whole process of doing math is about uh, like getting from stuck to unstuck is expanding your understanding of mathematics that's like the whole the main thing that you're doing is expanding your understanding of mathematics and increasing others understanding of mathematics so in any case the being stuck is a necessary step in it you're i mean looking again and again at two two times two is four and you know just like repeating it to yourself is not doing math if it's something you completely understand then uh, i mean move on um, there is a beautiful metaphor by, um, I forgot all the names of mathematicians, it's really unfortunate. I think by Andrew Wiles that um, doing math is like you're in a dark room and you're trying to, you know, uh, look, ar I mean, look around but you can't see anything so you try to, you know, uh, touch upon objects and you're very confused what's what's going on there. And like for some time you, you try to orient yourself in the room and then finally after half a year you find uh, the button that turns on light and for a minute you know you're excited that you can see everything but then it's time to go to the next dark room that's what's research um, um, um how do mathematicians get breaks from thinking about problems they're trying to solve. I mean, in lots of ways, but I mean, some people do sports, some spend time with their kids, some do teaching or try to work on different projects, some watch series. I don't know, any kind of breaks works for mathematicians as well. Mm. I mean, no one works without breaks. Uh, breaks are a fundamental part of any work one is doing, especially intellectual work. Like for intellectual work, breaks are uh, <laughs> uh, are important. Um, um, I don't know yet which books will I use for my algebraic geometry class. My favorite book is Ravi Vakil's The Rising Sea. Uh, I don't know how much can I implement it. Um, okay, how does one work with abstract machinery without being comfortable proving things about them? I mean, there is there are luckily great texts about this abstract machinery. I mean, there there are books by Lurie and papers by other people. Oh, sorry, I started with infinity categories. Anyway. Uh, if some things are, I mean, for, for this, like, abstract things that have been developed recently, I mean, not schemes, but infinity categories and, let's say, stacks, they're, they're very good sources, and that certainly helps. Mm, but that's these are also the black boxes that I mentioned. So you somehow accept that someone has done all the work for you, and you just use their work. Mm. I do not have a funny joke to answer the question with laughing smiles. Mm. Have only a non-funny information of studies on... No, that's not funny. No, look, this question deserves a funny joke. I don't have a joke. I would have had, okay, since you're not asking anything, I would say that I would have had a joke if anyone asked me about my personal life, I would have told you that 
I find it much more easier to make interviews with famous mathematicians than go on dates with random people because with famous mathematicians, I have much more in common so I can ask them things and that is much easier. And for other people, it seems to be the other way. I don't know how one talks to strangers. <laughs> but, um, I wanted to ask you guys questions also while we're still here, if someone is still here. Um, which videos do you want? Are there any requests for videos in, in the new year? Please write me if you have, I mean, not only interview suggest, but like if you have any suggestions for videos related to math life balance in some, some way, please tell me your suggestions. I'm happy to hear them. That is not very helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you had any suggestions that I could maybe not do exactly them, but uh, think about those directions. Mm. I mean, people start, so I think people, so there's a question when one starts writing a paper, when one has results or before that. I think people often start, say, a tech file or, I don't know, create a Dropbox folder when they have some thoughts and ideas, maybe not necessarily results, but then people start usually um, start writing um, results, uh, sorry, like start writing actual paper when they think they do have results. But then, you know, when you start writing it often, very often turns out that you have a mistake or mistakes or gaps or things you didn't realize. So um, then, you, then you have to work much more. So writing is always, people often postpone it because it's like, ah, they'll just write it up later. But then when you write down things, you very often realize there are some gaps that you haven't seen when you were just discussing ideas. So writing is very important, although it's um, although it's hard. Mm. Bidim, bidim, bidim. Okay, so what are your suggestions? I think so. Jean Pierre has there are lots of interviews with him, right? Um, Okay, so how does one start reading a book or a paper? I mean, it depends. Uh, it depends how, it depends on the purpose. Like it's very, I mean, I think it's very, it helps when you start reading something to know why you're reading this, just out of curiosity, because you need to find out something. So this affects the way you're reading it, right? If you're just being curious, then, just, I mean, look at it and enjoy. If you are trying to find something, then maybe, uh, well, for example, my one of my co-authors was angry with some paper that didn't have a con section, like section uh, table of contents. And he said, the table of contents is the most important part in the paper. And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, because like it, it, so he said he starts reading a paper with like looking through the table of contents to see to read it as, as a summary of the paper. So I would never guess one should do that. But since then I look at the table of contents, it's really helpful. So you see, um, um, depends on whether you're looking for something particular or you want a summary or, you know, if you're looking for something particular, open it in a PDF and use search for the word you're looking for. That's what we often do. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. So. Oh, the time machine and interview with Conway. Oh, this would be great. If I had a time machine, I would interview Conway, Thurston, and Sofia Kovalevska. This would be my top three. <laughs> I don't have a time machine, but I don't know which would be yours. Um, I'm not sure I want to keep this stream because I think I've said a bunch of things 
about concrete people, which I should not be saying. <laughs> so yeah, maybe not. Um, okay, are there any more questions? Um, I suggest that we finish in 10 minutes. So if you have anything to ask, feel free now. Mm. Mm. Look, when I, I mean, for analysis, I don't have any recommendations because when I learned analysis, our lecturer has written his own book. So this was, a, I think, the best lecture I had in the best. So, you know, that book was very helpful, but it's in Russian. I don't think it got translated. So uh, whatever your lecturer suggests might be a good book. Usually for analysis, there are... There are good books. Who is math idol? But what do you, I mean? What do you mean? I think I am personally more inspired by people in math who, mm, who, who, who present math well. So if people who can make complicated things seem easy are that's exciting for me. And also, I'm happy when people have other interests beside math and have a um, expand. How do you say broad? vision with within math and also outside and uh, that's great i've been very lucky with my bosses i think um, my bosses tend to have lots of interests and that's great um <laughs> there's a request for a video a day in your life and actually i was planning to go home for holidays and i had a flight to st petersburg for december 31st and i wanted to vlog like you know coming home and meeting my family and my tortoise and my christmas tree well new year's tree and the presents and you know i thought i could do the silly happy video and then i <laughs> i was dancing in the bathroom to the song it's a beautiful life and i hurt my foot badly so i couldn't walk properly and i didn't go home and <laughs> So um, that's, that's a story. <laughs> that's a very good question. How do I convey what I do to common people? Well, badly. I always people always ask what I what you do, and I always try to explain. And the, I mean, people lose interest after one minute, usually. So it's hard. But maybe so. I discussed this question in the live stream with Olga Paris Ramaskevich about conveying math to common pe to common people, sorry, to non-mathematicians. Um, I think one suggestion she had was maybe to not introduce yourself as a mathematician, maybe, or like not start talking about math right away, but somehow start with another angle and then within put in math. So maybe I should introduce myself as a YouTuber or something. And then people are like, oh, which kind of videos you're making? And you can say, oh, I'm making videos with mathematicians. People will be like, why mathematicians? And then, you know, like if you start with um, maybe not, not directly, that's maybe the right thing. But yeah, I don't have a good answer to this. I, I wish someone had, a, I wish someone told me how to, how to, explain what I do. Maybe one thing one could do is like, instead of trying to explain what you do is try to give an example of a math question or a math problem. Oh, wait, I have, I have a story. So um, <laughs> I spent Christmas in an, in an Italian family and there was a 12 year old girl who asked me what I do. And I said, well, I do math. And she was like, oh, what does it mean? And I said, well, you know, I try to prove theorems. You know, I tried to avoid giving any details, but she was insisting she really, and although she she didn't um, she didn't um, she didn't speak English well, so it was she was young and didn't speak English well, and she really wanted to know what do mathematicians do somehow more you know more concretely. She was like, "What are you paid for?" And so I took a I took a napkin. We were sitting at a dinner table, and I said, "Well, look, if you have this triangle, then the Pythagoras theorem tells you that the sum of these square lengths." is this square length, square of this length. So if this is one and this is one, then the square of this thing is two. However, no natural number uh, gives um, its square being two. So this must be some number that is not any number you know, and yet it exists. And she was very confused. Okay, I gave, I mean, I, I, 
I was I explained it a little bit better, but not much better. So she was very confused and she kept asking, what do you mean? Like, how can it be? And I, you know, I told her a couple more times that, look, this is an example of a number that you don't know, but still it exists. And, and, and like when she third time said, I don't understand. Then I told her, uh-huh, this is what we do. <laughs> um, not that it was a satisfactory answer for her, but I think giving her the experience of a five minute Try, like given you know trying to understand some piece of math and not understanding what a person is telling to you is a more honest way to explain what mathematicians do than my usual speech on algebraic geometry and blah 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 and not only so yeah she was interested but also she felt the frustration of not understanding like it was just you know i told her a few sentences and she already got to the the usual point of a mathematician of you know being told something that that clearly makes sense for the other person but not yet for you um and sounds counterintuitive. So I think I, I was happy. She was not happy. Boy, she was not happy. She was angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> was Pythagoras murdered? I thought Archimedes was murdered. Okay, maybe maybe I forgot how, how sad things were. Um, okay, so meanwhile you got you wrote a bunch of questions um i don't think it's a choice between trying to prove theorems and trying to conjecture them i mean if you can conjecture great for you but also of course you i mean you you read some things and then you try to imagine some things so people do recommend if you read a statement First, give it give it a thought. Like, think for a couple minutes. How would you prove it before reading the proof? People do recommend um, do recommend doing this, and uh, that that can be helpful. Mm. But of course, at some point, you will have to just read proofs, not not being able to conjecture them on your own. I mean, that's often difficult. But yeah, maybe taking a, a break, like a small break between reading a statement and reading the proof and trying to think yourself is a good idea. Um, okay, so <laughs> how does one work on a problem without having someone to guide you? Uh, find someone to guide you. Uh, the more people, the better. I mean, uh, ask questions, ask for guidance. Mathematicians are generically very helpful people. They're usually willing to help. Uh, so you'll be, you'll be fine. Just uh, don't be afraid to ask people. Um. <laughs> okay, so um, is it useful to keep trying to prove a theorem for a few days? I mean, if you want to, sure, go for it, but don't waste all your life on trying to prove one theorem, maybe. I, I mean, you, everyone has to find a balance, these like balances for yourself. There is no one who will tell you, oh, spend 55 minutes on this and then 47 minutes on that. Like, no, you, you, you try and you play with it and you find what works for you. There is no universal answer. There was, so there is a difficult question about math community not appreciating simplifications of existing uh, proofs and um, presentations comparing to new proofs. This is a difficult question because people. I think people do appreciate uh, people in general. Every single person does appreciate someone writing a better proof. However, when you apply for jobs uh, or let's say send papers to journals, you 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 get less credits for rewriting something older in a better way than for proving something new, which is unfortunate because as Thurston writes in his paper, it is our job to, to improve the understanding and improve older proofs. And so I, I, I think this is unfortunate, this credit situation. However, I hope that, um, that, I mean, we can speak more about it and we can, uh, what can we do to remedy this situation? I, uh, I hope people still do work on improving proofs and presentations and I hope we as a community can praise them more for doing it. Yeah, uh, this is very important to do, I think. So, um, um, 
Okay, so discussion on um, uh, on killing uh, on killing mathematicians in ancient Greek Greece. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a, uh, it's a sad topic, but it's funny to read your comments. Um, you can write me. I don't know any combina people who do combine charts, so you can write names. Mm. Okay. Um, I don't have opinions on, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't think sharing opinions on people, especially people I don't know in person is a great idea. My opinion on the situation of, um, paparazzis and journalists harassing uh, a person is that they should not be doing it. So um, it's a sad story, uh, which I, th I mean, I, I, to me personally, the whole story of solving one of the millennium problems and then being bombarded by people accusing you of not taking money is a sad story. Um, I believe that money should not be given for solving math problems because it leads to conflicts like that. And to lots of people who think they prove Fermat love theorem and write letters and emails about it <laughs> to mathematicians. <laughs> um, I think it's a good place to, to end. Thanks a lot for all your questions. I was very happy that you all came and enjoy the new year. Um, I do want to. Uh, I do. I do want to interview people who quit academia and move to other fields. I do really do. I asked several of them. Only one agreed so far. We have an interview with Saul Glasman, which I am the most proud of because I think it's non-trivial. Uh, but I hope to do some more in the future. Um, yeah. Th uh, thank you all for coming. Um, Happy New Year, enjoy your year and enjoy doing math and enjoy taking breaks also. Um, have fun. Bye-bye.